good morning uh, in fact uh, there was a slight uh, gap in my last communication uh, and then uh, our proposed uh, midweek uh, lecture for some reason uh, we couldn't uh, make it uh, although i was prepared but some other engagement kept me away uh, anyway i was uh, having little time this morning uh, before i leave uh, a bit early so we'll be able to discuss the money supply process while this being said uh, uh, i believe uh, you got opportunity to kind of go through the material the money supply process uh, you are having with you uh, but before I move on, um, any questions uh, you all wanted to clarify with respect to the topic or any other things we have covered? And I hope you are having the screen visible so I can uh, take you through with the presentation uh, in a little while. And as usual, either you can raise your voice, if not, you can uh, put it in text form and share with me so i can follow up uh, 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 any further discussion with respect to the topic so interestingly uh, the the money supply, money supply process that we are discussing uh, is one of the very interesting and key areas for you all to uh, uh, kind of uh, understand with respect to this uh, the central banking uh, activities itself so we talked about uh, the 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 open market purchase up to open market purchase but before that i again reiterate the fact that when you look at a central bank balance sheet, it's easy from a perspective to look at a central bank balance sheet and then try to interpret it because uh, the, the other side of the same coin is often the commercial banks, if not the financial intermediaries balance sheet. So when you look at the Federal Reserve or the central bank's balance sheet, please consider the liability side. That is, the, that is often comprised of uh, currency in circulation. What you have in your wallets, what you have with your parents in their wallets, or whatever you have saved uh, in your house, right? Or whatever place is actually the money printed by the monetary authority in any country, right? So this is on the part of monetary authorities, the liability. They have to account for what is in circulation. This includes coins too, but for the easy understanding, we'll say currency in circulation, right? So this is one of the major liabilities of any financial uh, 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 regulator, mainly the monetary authorities all across the world, except in one or two uh, isolated considerations that's the first point the second point is reserves this reserves reserves could be few other forms too but by reserves here what i try to explain is the the commercial banks maintenance of certain share of their deposit uh, uh, liability with the central bank so these are the uh, ones we call in Sri Lankan parlance the uh, statutory reserve requirement. So the statutory reserve requirement is a certain percentage of your deposits being held with the central bank. This was uh, 2% up until September 1st. On September 1st, this was increased to 4%. Right? So from the deposit base, there's a reasonable share for instance if you look at sri lanka's deposit space you can um, easily look at it like uh, 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 let's say eight to nine trillion 
So when you see 8 trillion, so you can get a kind of a feel. Right? So 4% of this need to be maintained um, and this has to be kept in the uh, central bank's uh, uh, books as a reserves. So these reserves and currency in circulations are the main liabilities in the books of central bank. And then from the asset side, the securities. The central bank buys securities from the market or directly from the government. Treasury bills, they purchase. So these are effectively assets in the central bank's books. You buy an asset, let's say you also buy an asset to asset from the government securities market. That is an asset you want. Similarly, central bank buys, it's an asset central bank owns. So that central bank assets, for this asset, central bank would have paid the currency. So that creates a liability in the form of currency in circulation. Then loans. Central bank also lends number different type of uh, loans to the financial intermediaries. They can come and borrow from the central bank. So they borrow, uh, they uh, uh, facilitate these uh, 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 financial arrangements to financial intermediaries uh, to make sure the financial markets are maintained in, a, in an orderly uh, uh, condition. So these loans, that the central bank has extended is a is an asset in central bank's books there are various other forms of assets and liabilities in the central bank's federal reserves books but for easy understanding we will broadly look at uh, this as um, uh, securities and loans as assets whereas um, uh, 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 currency in circulation and reserves as liabilities that would make our life easy and simple. So we discussed these points in our uh, last discussion and then we came to uh, uh, highlight uh, so-called uh, monetary base, right? So within monetary base you basically see the liability side of the central bank's balance sheet, currency in circulation and the reserves. And we also use the word high powered money, no difference. That's the same monetary base. Okay. So you can see these elements get influenced as and when central banks engage in different type of activities, particularly the open market operations. We discuss uh, one of the very straightforward element of open market operations that is OMO open market operation purchase and by I have tried to explain it from the non-bank public that means from the general public but please understand central banks do not necessarily directly engage with non-bank public that means the general public but they engage with financial intermediaries who maintains accounts with the central bank. There are circumstances, uh, direct accounts of general public can be, but that's not the common uh, central banking uh, open market operations uh, format. So they generally go through the banking sector, uh, financial intermediaries uh, as their account holders. They transact with them, of course, Banking intermediaries transact with other general public and through which they have cre created assets. If not, they have assets with them or they have sold assets that they have purchased from open market operations. So you have seen open market purchase. Effectively, this open market purchase resulting in uh, right the monetary base to increase. Right. So we have uh, explained that in greater details by kind of going through each and every stage of that open market purchase and explaining to you when you purchase the asset which prevailed in the uh, uh, general public's hand exchange from them to the central bank's book 
as a result central bank's uh, asset side has increased by the amount of the securities that they have purchased correspondingly uh, uh, until such time uh, the the general public kept that in non cash form it was reflected as reserves in the central bank's uh, liability side but as soon as they have converted that into the cash form it has converted from reserves to currency in circulation however the ultimate impact of that purchase is the monetary base that means c plus r either c or r has gone up by the amount of open market purchase in this example the ultimate impact to the uh, currency in circulation right so this was what we discussed uh, last week and this is where uh, we stopped I repeated this simply because I wanted to make sure that you are also on board with same understanding with respect to the discussion. Any questions? Right. Please um, uh, stop me if you want to clarify anything. If not, uh, you can, uh, as usual, uh, put down your uh, a question in the text text mode so I can follow up that too right so you see here the effect of open market purchase to increase the monetary base similarly what happens when there's an open market sale What happens to open market sale? Right. So when you see open market, these central banks uh, uh, often have uh, their uh, monetary policy operations related uh, uh, a desk. And, and, and I was explaining to you the Federal Reserve System in US where we were talking very highly about uh, New York Fed Reserve, where the open market desk of the New York Fed Reserve remains one of the most active and influential desks of open market operations in the world. Because they do transact many trillions or many billions each and every uh, day to make sure the, the money supply adjust on the basis of their activities. And correspondingly, you will see changes to the overall market conditions, including the interest rates and indirectly to the exchange rate as well. Right? So you see the open market sale when you sell from your own holdings. That means central banks already held reserves not reserves securities right so you sell from the security stock of central bank uh, uh, already held in it, held in its portfolio so when you see a sale what happens to the asset side so you see the securities held by the federal reserve system or the central bank reduces by the amount of open market transaction open market sale in this instance so we assume the transaction uh, uh, amounts to 100 million dollars so the security side reduced by 100 million dollars similarly when you sold that to the non-band public, right? Uh, again, I take out the middle step here. That is the commercial bank in the middle, right? So directly this goes to the uh, customer from a different perspective. So what happened there is 
when central bank sold who gets this security the general public non bank public so he gets an asset in the form of securities equal to 100 million dollars so his uh, uh, asset side increases central bank's asset side decreases for this purchase the customer if not the general public has to settle his obligations uh, he generally don't have ability to create uh, reserves in the form of what banks does when central bank does transactions with the banks but he has to settle it through currency so he has to pay so when he pays for his uh, purchase his currency what he what he held at that point of time reduces by the same amount of open market sale so his asset side increases with the security he purchased decreases with the currency he owed right so that minus 100 million us dollars and central bank gets this currency but effectively when central bank get this currency into its own uh, uh, arrangements or the central bank's books by that amount of currency that came back to central bank's uh, 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 wallets which was previously in the general public's hands in circulation reduces the liability of currency in circulation uh, uh, previously had in the economy so that reduces the liability in the central bank's books because you have injected or you have allowed currency in circulation of let's say uh, 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 1 billion so from that 100 million now came in to the central bank's books so by that 100 million central bank's liabilities now reduces and therefore from that point onwards 1 billion minus uh, 100 million so it is 900 million is what available in for available in the economy for circulation so that's what it's very clearly reflects and central bank gets this currency in thereby it reduces liability side reduces by 100 million so what the impact of sale as we already seen c plus r so c reduces that means the monetary base monetary base reduces by the amount of open market sale here there is no impact to the resource so resource remain unchanged resource also would have come into the picture if the intermediary financial agency exists because that's the usual form of uh, transactions happen because uh, central bank does not necessarily deal directly with public right so resource in this case kept aside no touching fine no impact for the reserves so the effect of open market operation on the monetary base is very much certain when it comes to a sale than purchase purchase could have the possibility that the general public keeping it in uh, account form or converting it to uh, a currency form that would decide how much of the reserves converted to currency or how much still continue to maintain as reserves there's some uncertainty in terms of how that happens when it comes to a purchase but when it is a sale much more certain they have to pay in currency without uh, kind of any involvement of reserves because you don't create reserves for general public so that's the certainty in terms of sale so central banks at times where they require overall market uh, 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 surplus money surplus or liquidity conditions to decrease they straightforwardly go and sell their assets assets in the form of securities they hold in their portfolio now central bank of sri lanka you look at it they have uh, uh, uh assets in the form of uh, securities mainly treasury bills in its portfolio or 
the law provides, Monetary Law Act provides Central Bank of Sri Lanka to create its own securities, not government securities, but central bank securities in its own books to make sure they make use of such securities to do open market operations. But central banks often try to do with government securities or other securities available in the market because those securities are already established and very much accepted by market participants for transactions. Central bank securities, markets also accept and at times it's much more sought after than other securities. But then uh, uh, general public does not have much of a familiarity with that central bank security. Treasury bill, everybody knows. Corporate bonds, everybody knows. In Sri Lanka, we don't take corporate bonds into central banks, open market operations, except at very different times where banks or the financial intermediaries required to pledge, give collaterals, those assets being considered, but not under normal circumstances. So what I'm trying to say is central bank usually transact with its own uh, uh, asset securities portfolio at times where they don't have uh, uh, government securities or other securities in its portfolio. So the laws provide for creation of central bank's own securities if required. But they have often a reasonable amount of other securities to do this type of transactions. So you see open market say. So the impact is also uh, reasonably clear cut uh, when you look at the uh, transactions of this nature. Right. Then also there's a possibility changes from uh, deposits into currency. Right. So who changes deposits into currency? Either the bank or the general public. Right. So you can start from central bank side itself. As I was explaining to you, that's reasonably easy for us to uh, adjust when it comes to uh, 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 a movement of uh, liability side or asset side of the central bank. So you see uh, now general public eyeing to change their deposits into currency. So from a perspective of uh, a central bank, uh, deposits reduction invariably refers to reduction in reserves held with the central bank by the financial intermediary, the banking system. So immediately, immediately the reserves held with the central bank by let's say bank A reduces when somebody wants to convert their deposits into currency. So again, $100 million as the example, you see a uh, uh, Fed Reserve System, if not central bank's books, the liability side reduces in the form of uh, reserves by $100 million. Then the banking system, when the reserves decline, assets, the reserves are assets of banks, reserves are liabilities of the central bank. So the liability reduced and then central bank books are just accordingly. And similarly, the bank, bank K, let's say, the banking system, his asset side reserves also decreases by the same amount. By running down their reserves, what the bank is expected to do they wanted to convert this into currency. So they demand currency from the central bank. <clears throat> so effectively central bank converts its reserves into 
currency in circulation and thereby liability side of the central bank reserves decreases currency in circulation increases by the same amount of transaction 100 million dollars then this currency goes to the bank's books right so banks already adjusted its reserves because they have converted their reserves uh, by 100 million. So you see asset side decreases, but this reserves he has converted, bank has converted now, is actually a customer's uh, deposits, right? So that customer's deposit in the form of checkable deposits right also now reduces from what it was by the amount of transaction so the banking books also shows the effect of reserves decline and checkable deposits decline and the non-bank side that's the ultimate who engage directly with the economy economic activities of course banks also does but we are looking at ultimate beneficiary they are the customer who see his accounts deposits maintained with the bank reduces by the amount that he converted into currency and currency in his hands increases by the amount of that conversion so effectively shifting from deposits into currency has contributed to increase the monetary base in the form of currency but correspondingly adjusted the reserves by the same amount so the net amount of monetary liabilities or the monetary base in this instant is zero you have run down the reserves equal amount you have run up the currency in circulation so C has increased, R has decreased. C plus R equals MB, monetary base. Okay. So effect is zero and the monetary base is reasonably static, if not stable. In such circumstances, and, and this is also much more straightforward when somebody converts uh, their deposits into currency. So loans, you see, all the financial intermediaries borrow from the central bank. Central banks have different types of loans. Some loans are, they labeled as uh, very short term and these are uh, uh, they call it uh, overnight uh, lending facilities right similarly they have discount window they have uh, 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 various other forms of loans including lender of last resort loans where the banks who try to get money from everywhere else but fail and come to the central bank but not necessarily they try to borrow from everywhere else because that itself creates a panic in the eyes of general public so after a point when they see it's challenging for them to raise money they would come to the central bank so central bank lend to the financial intermediaries And you know, loans in the books of central banks is an asset. So they borrow from the central bank or from the Fred. As I always mention, look at it first from the central bank side, it's easy. So you see central banks assets increases, in this case, $100 million by the amount of loan financial intermediary obtained from the central bank so the asset side 
loans increase by 100 million and central bank do not necessarily uh, go and give this loan to the bank's hands or anything so they what they do often is they have the accounts of these banks maintained with the central bank so they credit the loan facility and that loan facility build the reserves in the names of that bank so they have created an asset in the form of loan they have created a liability in the form of reserves so in the eyes of banks they have created a liability in the form of loans from the central bank and they have created an asset in the form of reserves so they can use it at any time now they have uh, got the uh, uh, loan facilitated by creation of the reserve so they have the reserves for usage so the monetary liabilities of the central bank because of this increases as well as the monetary base you know c plus r r has gone up at what point they convert these reserves into currency that's a different stage then what happened there is resource would reduce currency in circulation would decrease right so it's a corresponding adjustment but what is interesting here is by the amount of the the loan the monetary base has increased uh, straightforwardly so apart from what i was explaining to you in terms of open market operations there are various other forms also even including so called sterilization sterilization what is this injections giving like so what you are meaning here is this domestic currency based transactions i was referring but at the same time central bank could do foreign exchange related trans transactions right so they buy dollars they sell dollars when they sell dollars to the market what happened there is currency in circulation reduces because banks have to buy the dollars for that they have to pay in domestic currency by the amount of that per purchase of foreign currency from the central bank right the 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 currency in circulation reduces because they have to pay like open market sale so they had to pay so when they pay currency in circulation reduces similarly when they buy from the market foreign exchange come into the central bank's books domestic currency goes out currency in circulation increases so it's an injection first one is an absorption of uh, liquidity second one is an injection of liquidity to the market through that the amount of money that was circulating in the market changes the base for that transaction was foreign exchange if you leave aside that at that point without correspondingly doing anything we call it non sterilized for in exchange transaction you have left it with the foreign exchange transaction itself but if the open market operations tries to nullify the impact of foreign exchange transactions by correspondingly engaged in a domestic market transaction let's say when they sold for in exchange i said currency in circulation reduced because central bank sold for in exchange for that banks have to pay in 
currency in circulation. So they paid by currency, by that amount, currency reduced. So to nullify that reduction in currency in circulation, central bank purchased securities from the market. So correspondingly, central bank ultimately increase the currency in circulation by purchase of securities. So such an action to nullify the effect of foreign exchange related activity or similar other activities, we call it sterilization of uh, activities. Non-sterilization, as I was explaining, they do not actually try to nullify the effect of foreign exchange in the first place. So that also influences the monetary base, COR in the equation when it comes to its activities. In addition to that, you see there are other various forms of uh, factors that affect, if not uh, influences the monetary base. One is so-called float. And, and in a way, this is the transaction in transition. Right? So float is a money in the banking system that is briefly counted twice due to delays in processing, let's say, instructions. But today, I simply see this is not necessarily that significant simply because the systems are such that the transactions are instantaneous. You are allowed in the first place to do a, a, a transactions when you have balances. When you have a balance, when you do a transactions uh, through instructions, checks some instructions, not necessarily the papers that we used to carry and sign and give. That's old school and old fashioned now. But still, I mean, there's checks and people accept it and uh, they do transactions. Some use it as a prestige, fine. So this could have some influence in the middle until it get processed. So that money get counted twice in such possibility. So that's a float. So float is usually when you see banks credit the customer, but now bank says at the time of crediting of the customer, the account will be deposited only when money is realized not immediately increase the uh, 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 account. From the other side, whoever gave the check, his account uh, will be often uh, uh, reduced by the amount of uh, the check he has written. But he would have written without a positive balance, then he would go for overdraft or whatever. That's the process. It has its own uh, merits and demerits, all kind of things. Right? So time taken from uh, receiver's bank uh, to payer's bank, all this being factored. Uh, and this could get the balances reflected uh, for a certain uh, time duration. So that's what effectively happens here. Right. So you see here the, the float that makes the transactions reflect in um, uh, 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 payers as receivers and that could be counted twice. But as I was explaining, increasingly this become instantaneous in today's uh, infrastructure available in the financial markets and as a result, uh, uh, it's very minimal in the sense uh, this get reflected in monetary base, but still it get count whenever they are there. 
So there's other other possibility. Treasury, that means government, general treasury is the Ministry of Finance, uh, the, the, the treasury. They deposit uh, with the central bank. They get revenue, they get uh, other forms of receipts, uh, even foreign finances. So that get uh, reflected and that get uh, deposited with the central bank. So either form, uh, that do not reflect, although that money gets in the first place, uh, monetary circulation get reduced if they bring it and deposit in the central bank because their account will increase until such time they use that was not in the circulation. Either it's previously in the circulation or if it is a foreign receipts, but the, what the usually the treasury does see is sell that to the market and get the equivalent rupees. But often they do not sell to the commercial banks, but they sell it to the central bank. So central bank gets foreign assets into its portfolio and releases the required exchange rate valued uh, a corresponding domestic currency amount. So by that amount, currency in circulation increases. Right? So the the these things affect uh, the monetary base when treasury deposits and the uh, intervention in the foreign exchange market as i was explaining sterilization non-sterilization we were talking that's what it's about the intervention so there are two that affect the monetary base okay so we can move on We can move on to now discuss the ability of the central bank to influence the monetary base or the control the monetary base. Any questions? Right. So you see Open market operations, OMOs, are conducted by the central banks. Okay. So, you have now seen different type of OMO activities we explain, and that's under the uh, control of the central bank and central bank's uh, ability in terms of how to influence the monetary base through those uh, open market operations. But effectively, the decision of how much to borrow from the central bank is not with the central bank. It is a decision by the banks or the financial intermediaries or ultimately, let's say, the general public the economic agents. They are the ones determine how much to borrow. Although central bank wants to lend 1 million, 1 trillion, let's say, banks would stop at uh, a quarter trillion simply because for various other reasons. Central bank wants to lend uh, this much, but banks stop at that simply because they, if they see economic activities are not expanding by the amount of uh, the expected increase in money supply, whatever they have already obtained from, borrowed from central bank is not being transferred across the economy, they would slow down their borrowing. So the decision to borrow rests with the hands of the banks or the general public, but not with the Federal Reserve or the Central Bank. So because of this reason, you can now look at the monetary base in the form of borrowed monetary base and 
non borrowed monetary base so at any given point of time the amount of reserves and currency in circulation can be either non borrowed basically the assets and liabilities created through bank's own operations or there's a component within that monetary base the banks have borrowed from the central bank or the fed reserve in this case so what you are basically seeing here is you are splitting the monetary base into borrowed and non borrowed so monetary base non borrowed mb n here small n equals nothing but monetary base minus borrowed reserves so anything that you borrow from the central bank is what we do central bank does in the the cash, i mean the the accounts that you have seen in balance sheets you create an a reserve in the name of the bank who borrow so you basically take out from the monetary base the borrowed reserves amount then you can calculate what is the monetary base non non borrow so ultimately you have to see whether it's borrowed or non borrowed any increase in borrowed or non borrowed would increase the monetary base that means it is positively related any upward change in borrowed or non borrowed would have an upward change in monetary base any downward change in borrowed or non borrowed would have a downward effect on monetary base so that is positive relationship increase would result in increase in monetary base decrease would result in decrease in monetary base right so you increase the borrowed resource ultimately that increases the monetary base you decrease the borrowed resource by that amount or differently it would reduce the monetary base right so that's the understanding to kind of you know move into some uh, 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 further elaboration of this in the form of monetary base being looked at in the form of a borrowed monetary base as well as non borrowed so non borrowed monetary base can be easily identified by reducing the borrowed reserves from the aggregate number of monetary base you look at at any given moment of time so mbn equals mb minus borrowed reserves right right so then now we head towards a situation where when you increase the monetary base or the reserves change in positive changing reserves would increase the monetary base but please understand the fact that when you increase the reserves monetary base does not increase simply by that amount it could have multiplied impact how we will come to that now so this is explained as multiple deposit creation this is not simple but it's a complex process but still we could explain through a simple model right 
so to say that you have banks so let's say first national bank in this example we can simply call it uh, bank a for our understanding right so they have run down the securities they held in its portfolio maybe in this instance they would have sold that to open market open market would have purchased it i'm not uh, uh, explain that side for the time being i'm just looking at now the bank's books they have seen their security is reduced by that amount their reserves increased 100 million dollars so security is reduced reserves increased so this reserves they can actually convert to a loan because they have now reserves maintained with the central bank so they can run down that reserve and create a loan on behalf of a customer so immediately when you convert this reserve amount to a loan loan also an asset in the books of financial intermediary but this loan he has created is now been deposited with this bank by the customer and that is the check checkable deposit the deposit owns to the customer right so customer's name uh, creates a checkable deposits and that's become a liability because that deposit belongs to customer not to the bank but loan is an asset in the bank's book so banks create the loan as an asset deposit as a liability so ultimately you take out this intermediary process in which this movements happens take out the reserve component in the equation in the asset side of this bank what the, what you are reflecting is the security has gone down and security has created reserves fine reserves have subsequently converted into a loan and that's a multiple uh, 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 the the checkable deposit was created and ultimately checkable deposit could go out various forms the central bank would reflect that in its books uh, separately in the bank's book it could end up as security reduced loan has created so the the process itself has the possibilities that we are moving into reserves being segregated within this entire exercise that we are trying to say right the process would come into a point where reserves have created but whether that reserve is excess or not uh, uh, we will come into that point and explain it so if there is excess reserves what it influences in terms of uh, its ability to further create expansion in money supply right so the banks required to maintain certain point amount of its um, deposits in the form of reserves statutory reserves but anything they keep more than that that stand amounts to excess reserves by that amount the banks would lose its ability to create new loans right but usually banks keeps a very little margin over required reserves because they also know the changes but man bank could also go into a position where their reserves are below the required amount then they have to borrow 
and replenish the required resource. It's all a process. In this process, you see, by converting their reserves, they can create multiple deposits. And through that multiple deposit creation, the money supply get expanded beyond the general expansion in C plus R. C plus R is the basic, the core, highly liquid component of monetary aggregates, that is money supply. So where we just take currency in circulation and reserves, that is very important, very nice uh, yardstick. But by that yardstick, you will see the expansion to the money supply is multiple. That's what we are trying to understand through this process now. Right. So we come to the exercise here, which tries to explain you a structure where in the first place, you have seen the reserves of $100 million and this hundred million dollars right being uh, established as a loan in the previous slide where loans have gone to hundred and then checkable deposits as hundred so the customer obtain the loan and that all loan amount being kept as a deposit with the bank. Right? So the checkable deposit, 100 million, is now rest with the bank A. Assuming so-called statutory reserve requirement is 10%. In Sri Lanka, I said 4%. Okay. Now, in other countries also, it is low side of single digit most of the time. Right. For easy understanding, let's say it is 10%. So, from the deposit that the customer created, how much the bank now needed to keep with the central bank? take it as 10% for the time being. So when you take 10% out of 100, the reserve requirement that this bank need to maintain with the central bank is only $10 million. So you can see here, reserves now created 10 million. So this customer has not taken his money out. He has still maintained it in his uh, account as 100. Fine. Of this 100, you have to keep 10% with the central bank. So that is an asset for the bank, a liability in the central bank. You don't see the central bank here. So what left with this bank in the form of the deposit created by this customer until he withdraws, does whatever. The balance here in this checkable deposit is 90 now. This 90, the bank could create a new loan to another customer. Right. So immediately he creates this 90 million loan. Okay. Then what, what you simply see is 
the loan has again become a checkable deposit because the loan receiver has not converted that loan into currency or he has started using it. So the entirety of that deposit is now become a, a checkable deposit because that loan has created for 90. He has kept the entire amount, uh, 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 the checkable deposit form. So that amount straightforwardly again goes and rests with the central bank as reserves. But then, you know, 10% is the requirement. Out of 90, what is the 10%? 9. So what you can do now here is only leave another 9 with the central bank as reserves and take out 90 minus 9. Initially 100 minus 10. Now 90 into 10% that is 9. So 90 minus 9, you have 81 balance. You can take out uh, from your reserves and again create a loan. Okay. So you can create a loan here, 81. And that customer also keeps this 81 again as a, another fresh checkable deposit. And from that 81, you can again see what is the required reserves 10 percent that is 8.1 so 81 minus 8.1 would be 72.9 so you can go on like this of creating multiple deposits from a, a certain amount of reserves that you maintain with the central bank until such time these customers change these deposits into other forms like currency. Right? So that's a very straightforward, assuming that they are not changing their checkable deposits straight away to currency. So you can go on in a very a uh, 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 mechanized manner like 10% keep balance you have been created that's the way in which banks operate they do not keep entire 100 with the central bank as reserves the reserve requirement is only a certain percentage in this example 10 so the central bank would not make a big uh, percentage as a, a, a reserve requirement. No, a very small single digit uh, uh, percentage as reserve requirement. So you have to keep only that balance. You can go on creating deposits. So this is the multiple deposit creation. There are elements in between. We'll come to that. But this is very straightforwardly the multiple deposit creation. The banks could go on until uh, 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 the depositor start doing something else with his deposits. Then it could break down. We'll come to that point as we move on. Right? So this is an example now being illustrated and as we discussed reserve requirement is assumed as 10 percent so you see the first point of uh, initiation is you create the loan 100 million and immediately that 100 million was transferred to a deposit okay 
So what you simply see here is you have created the loan as the bank and the customer has created the deposit and he deposited the entire hundred. And being the reserve requirement uh, 10%, what you require to maintain with the central banks is 10% of 100, that is 10. The balance 90, you could again lend it as another loan. That's what they have done here, 90. And the customer has created that as a another deposit then what happens here is from this 90 how much you have to maintain 10 percent that is 9 the balance 81 you can lend it out as another loan that 81 the bank could create another deposit from this 81 what is required to be maintained as statutory reserve 10 percent that is 8.1. The balance 72.9, the bank can create as a loan. Then the customer who gets this loan, keep this as a deposit. How much of this deposits the bank has to keep with the central bank? 10%, 72.9. Of that 10% is 7.29. The balance is 65.61. Bank can create a loan. Customer gets the loan and he creates a deposit account, 65.61. 10% of this has the statutory reserve, 6.56. The balance is 59.05. You can go on this until such time, right? Until such time, there is no balance left with reserves other than the 10% reserve requirement, right? Anything you keep here in these reserves more than the required reserves are excess reserves. By that amount, you are ability to give new loans reducers by the amount of excess reserves. If it is 12 here, this become 88. Then what you can do here is 88. From 88, 10 is 8.8, .8, not 9. So you keep 10 here means from 88, 10 is this becomes 78. So it changes. But for the illustration, assuming that nothing is kept as excess reserves, nothing has been taken out by depositors from their deposits, you can go on and exercise this and you can basically see if it is 10%, this loans of initial 100, the deposits could actually increase 100 over 10, that means 10 times. If it is 100 over 5, it is 20 times. So assuming this reserve requirement is 5%, you do that. The same exercise what you are seeing here, we have taken 5%. You can now change this entire, this one. Instead of 10, you take it 5 and do it. And if you have Excel sheet in your computer, just put one or two numbers, drag it down. You will see how it changes. Very simple. But understand the principle behind this exercise. At any point, if this reserve number kept by the bank with the central bank carries the excess reserve, by the excess reserve amount, you have ability to create new deposits reducers. Then at any point, customer withdraws his deposits. The ability to create excess reserves breaks down. So this smooth pattern is assuming there is no excess reserves. 
the customers do not convert their deposits into currency. So you can see this smooth, smooth uh, kind of, you know, compilation, computation on that basis. You can go on, as I said, change this into 5, change this into 20 and see what happens to these aggregate numbers. The number of times you will be able to multiply your deposits would depend on 100 over the statutory reserve ratio. When it is 10, it is 10 times. When it is 5, it's 20 times. When it is 20, it is 5 times. Do it. Get the hands on. You will not forget that. So the banks does this. And as an experiment, change this required reserves with the excess one additional percent or two, or two additional percents, then see it will break down. You will not be able to come five times increase if you keep more than 20% here. More than 20% in these points. So by that amount, it breaks down. Though you will not land at total for the banking in terms of new deposits. So in terms of increase in loans. It will be lower number. So that's the underlying driver. Okay. So we are now heading towards deriving the formula for this multiple deposit creation. We assume that the banks do not hold excess reserves. Right? So total reserves is required reserves plus excess reserves. But when there is no excess reserves, total reserves is nothing but the required reserves. So required reserves is what? Required reserve ratio, small r times the total checkable deposits. We define it as uh, capital D, ratio as simple r. So r times d is required reserves and we assume required reserves is equals to total reserves in this instance because there are no excess reserves. So you basically come to the equation simple r. This is required reserve ratio times the deposits equals the reserves. Simple arithmetic here and there. You divide both sides by simple r, that is reserve ratio. So when you divide simple r times d by simple r, simple r to simple r sets off. So what you left with is deposits. That's equal. Here this is divided by simple r. It is nothing but 1 over R, simple R. Huh? Simple R is the reserve ratio times. What is this? Reserves. Capital R is reserves. And assumed in this point, reserves as required reserves because there is no excess reserves in this equation. So you can compute very simply, either by having D and simple R, what's the reserve, total reserves that you could create through a multiple deposit creation exercise, or by knowing total reserves and knowing uh, uh, risk required reserve ratio, What's the deposit that you can create? If you know two, you can derive the third one. So either way, if somebody tests you, asking this, you can 
you will be able to kind of you know give the straightforward answer in this exercise so to find out the change you can bring in delta change in deposits equal 1 over simple r times change in reserves so this uh, is again you don't go, need to go through this each step of this exercise by having uh, one or two these big numbers right with this number and this 10 percent you can derive this number this r yeah by having this required ratio and this r you can derive this t so it's exactly the same process but expressed in a, a, a equation formula you can actually try i really want you all to do the excel first because that would sets in your mind the process itself and then you can do this uh, simple equation assuming there are no excess reserves right as we were discussing no excess reserves so the total reserves are nothing but required reserves okay so we'll move on we derive the simple model but there are number of deficiencies as a result there's a lot of critics for this simple model. You already know some of them. One is holding cash stops the process. You have created a deposit account. Immediately upon extending the loan, 100 million checkable deposits you created what if that customer pulls out that deposit then there is no nothing beyond that point entire possibility of going into further deposits breaks down as soon as he withdraws his deposit Maybe full, maybe part. By that part, let's say he had 100 million uh, uh, checkable deposit, he withdraws 50. Bank has to keep 10% of his deposits fine. They have kept. So they had 90 then in the account, effectively in the bank's hands of the 100 million account created, deposit created. So he has taken 50. So what's bank left with is 40. So next point start not from 90, but from 40. 10% of that, you extend a new loan 40. 10% of that is four. So from that point onwards, you can go on 36. Of that 40 loan, that customer also takes out 20, let's say. So how much you left? 36 after keeping the statutory reserve. Customer took out 20. So you left with 16. So it's breakdown. Simple model breakdowns when there's a point where the client or the customer converts its account to cash. And currency has no multiple deposit expansion. It's the checkable deposits that has multiple deposit expansion, the currency. That is customer's behavior, right? From bank side, when they wanted to maintain reserves, they require to maintain required reserves. But banks are precautionary. They keep a little more than required reserves. 
let's say not 10 percent they go for 12 percent 11 percent from 100 12 percent is 12 then for the next loan they can go is not 90 but 88 So by that excess reserves, your ability to continue the deposit creation reduces. And this excess reserves, banks also would not necessarily use all the time to buy securities or make loans. Maybe at times they might take out the excess reserves, may invest in securities, Otherwise, they can make loans, but they would not. So the excess reserves would again constrain the ability holding cash, holding excess reserves, constrain the ability to create multiple deposits. So effectively, what you are now seeing is it's a depositor's decision how much currency to hold. It's a bank's decision how much an excess reserves to hold. This causes the money supply to change. Otherwise, if you go by the simple model or if you go by the Excel worksheet that we are talking here, you will be able to create 100 over required reserve ratio. The multiple deposit creation possibility through that the money supply increase. I said when it is 10%, 10 times when it is 5% it's 20 times when it is 20% it is 5 times that's breakdown it's a depositor's decision as well as banker's decision how much currency to hold how much excess reserves to hold so the equations break down when you see some influence in terms of the model is concerned. Okay. Any questions? Right. This is a very interesting and important section. You can uh, take your time to absorb some of those details, right? So you see here, we have now explained the critics for this simple model we discussed. And through this discussion, you have now recognized the factors that contribute, if not determine, the money supply. You know, changes in the monetary base in the form of non-borrowed. Right? You already know monetary base comprises of borrowed and non-borrowed, borrowed resource plus non-borrowed. So anything changes in terms of non-borrowed is positively related to money supply. Increase in non-borrowed uh, 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 resource <clears throat> or the monetary base increases the money supply decrease in non-borrowed monetary base decreases the money supply so from another perspective 
borrowed reserves from the central bank or the Fed. Again, positively related. Increase in uh, 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 borrowed reserves would increase the money supply. Decrease in the borrowed reserves would decrease the money supply. So it is also positively. Both borrowed reserves and non-borrowed monetary base positively related to the money supply. Okay. Then what is this uh, changes to the small R required reserve ratio? You know, I was telling 10% uh, adjust it to 20 and do the calculation. What happens there is 10 to 20, you increase the reserve ratio. By that amount, the multiple deposit creation shrink, substantially shrink. You saw when it is 10%, 100 divided by 10, you can increase the multiple deposit creation by 10 times. But when you make it uh, 20, 100 divided by 20, effectively 1 over ratio, 1 over ratio, 20% ratio is 0.2. 1 over 0.2 is 5. Previously 10, now it's 5. Money supply can be multiple deposit creation could contribute five times there to the money supply. So increase in reserve ratio decreases the multiple deposit creation and thereby the money supply. So to say that required reserve ratio is negatively related to the money supply. Borrowed reserves, non-borrowed reserves, positively related to the money supply. Required reserve ratio, you know, it is negatively related to the money supply. Then what about currency holdings? You saw what the customers do. If they wanted to keep entirety of their uh, uh, multiple deposit in the deposit form, no breakdown, multiple deposit creation works perfect. As soon as they convert part of uh, the deposit into currency, by that amount, the multiple deposits creation breaks down. So the changes to the currency holdings is negatively related to the money supply. What about the excess reserves? It's a bank's decision. Currency holding is a customer's, depositor's decision. Excess reserves is a bank's decision. The banks think no, not 10%. I have to keep 12%. What happens there? By that additional 2% that he keeps when the statutory reserve ratio or the small r is 10%, he keeps 12. So by that additional 2%, the multiple deposit creation possibility in the form of new loans get shrinked. So the changes in excess reserve ratio negatively related. When the excess reserve ratio increases, money supply through multiple deposit creation decreases. When excess reserve ratio decreases, by that amount, additional uh, uh, multiple deposit creation can be created, but excess reserves itself reduces the full possibility of multiple deposit creation. 
So that two negatively related. You see, borrowed and non-borrowed reserves are positively related, whereas reserve ratio, currency holdings, and excess reserves negatively related to the money supply. So this being presented, expressed here in a chart for you to understand. Change in variable borrowed monetary base, non-borrowed monetary base. And then you see uh, 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 change in the variable borrowed reserves increasing, which contributes to money supply to increase through more monetary base for deposit creation. That's the reason. But you see required reserve ratio, increasing required reserve ratio decreases the money supply response simply because less multiple deposit expansion. You know that. As I said, do it in Excel, increase the ratio. Then excess reserves, increase in the excess reserves reduces the money supply response through less loans and deposit creation. Then currency holdings increase in the variable currency holdings reduces the money supply response. So less deposit, multiple deposit expansion. You see here, again, these responses being segregated to central bank related, banks related or the depositor related. Through which you can now understand what's the impact when these variables changes. So I don't want to see that you are telling it goes up by exactly 100 million US dollar five times. That's all fine, perfect. But when you see this variable, which direction it's changing, you should be able to figure it out in which direction the money supply is going to change. That is what is expected. That understanding is required. If you can build that understanding by looking at these variables, you are in very good hands, in very good shape. Okay. So you see here, these details, very good, very important. Please repeat. I really stress this is very important area for you to understand it very clearly and see the multiple uh, 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 money creation uh, exercise we have done through the simple model that has its critics. We know its weaknesses. So that's why we would be going to a more appropriate money multiplier model. Okay, so I will not start defining, discussing this today because this requires you to have what I highlighted, digested nicely. So we can actually come to this point in our next discussion. Uh, and I appreciate if you have any question, you can raise it. If not, uh, uh, we can uh, stop today a little early. And as I said, uh, uh, next week, next Saturday, we would not have, for the time being, we would not have the class, but keep an eye on any communication from the IBSL. So IBSL would be able to uh, uh, expand it. Uh, if there's a possibility, even from a different location, I will try to log in and uh, have the session if I have the required uh, time to kind of, you know, go through the lesson. So we will uh, 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 maintain that stance. And if you have any questions, you can uh, 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 email it to, sorry, you can text it to me.
and you can if not you can raise uh, any queries so we can clarify that point otherwise uh, we will wait uh, either next saturday or any other communication if it is in between i keep wednesday 7 to 9 window if an option available if not uh, we will revert to Saturday cycles of 7 to 9 of the lectures. Uh, maybe we can finish our uh, discussion of uh, this subject um, in about another three lectures. So that's my time plan for the time being. So see how best that fits uh, with this. And we will start with the money multiplier and the uh, uh, more... Uh, uh, appropriate model of uh, money supply uh, uh, in 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 uh, the next discussion from simple model we discuss with all the related considerations if you don't have any further question uh, we'll stop at this point and we'll meet uh, either next saturday or based on uh, the communication but for the time being just take note that next saturday we will not have the time uh, seven nine lecture as of now i do i cannot uh, comment precisely i would not be in the country most likely on saturday next saturday okay all the best stay safe thank you